Good morning, DrupalCon. Hey, how's everyone doing? Excellent, yeah. Okay, um, I'd just like to get an idea of the audience uh, to start with. So um, if, if everyone in the audience who um, thinks of themselves as a, as a front-end developer, you could just raise your hand. Are there? Okay. Fair few there. Any, any of you sort of associate yourselves as a, as a back-end developer? Quite a few. Um, any, anyone who thinks of themselves more of a full-stack developer? A few full-stack developers there. Any managers out there? You know this is intermediate, right? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, has anyone dabbled with AngularJS so far? So a few people dabbled with it. Anyone got it in production at the moment? There's a couple of people. Um, anyone got it in production with, with Drupal? Wow. Um, okay, any React developers out there? Just come to Heckle. No? Okay, excellent. Okay, well, this is uh, a talk on building the front end with uh, AngularJS. Um, my name is John Enyu, a lead developer at uh, Deason. Uh, we're a, a digital agency based in Canterbury in the UK. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're basically at the moment, we're, we're moving to a distributed team model at the moment and we're hiring, so if anyone wants to talk to me about that afterwards, they can do. Um, I'm CNG on uh, Drupal.org and there's my Twitter handle at the bottom there, an occasional tweeter. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this talk's going to be all about um, building the front end with AngularJS. Um, so, uh, and at Decent, we've been using it for about a, a year now in, um, in, a, in a variety of settings. Um, and about a year ago, when we were looking at um, uh, why we were going to go about picking a front-end framework like this, um, the, the, the reasons we were, we were going out there to, to choose a front-end framework were uh, that... We were, we, were, we were feeling limited in, in some ways to the way that Drupal um, handled the front end and um, particularly when we're building very rich interactive um, apps, um, particularly Search was, was one of the first projects we were looking at. So we wanted to build a very um, engaging, immersive search experience. And what we thought was that the, the tools that Drupal provided out of the box weren't sufficient and we were looking for a front end framework where we could build out our search tools, our search capabilities um, and, and create that, that really rich user interface. Um, so we went out there and we were looking at the various things on the market. Um, AngularJS is um, um, supported by, by Google um, and, uh, and it's a, it's a front-end framework. So a front-end framework basically means that you're getting um, quite a lot of structure and rigor and, um, um, to your uh, JavaScript application and also it's providing uh, an awful lot of, of add-on extras as well, a lot of modules and things like this. Um, so I, I won't go into why you might want to use a front-end framework too much because um, Dries covered it in his, uh, in his keynote. Um, but if, uh, effectively what we're doing is um, in a traditional model, the, the user is at their, their computer or their, their device and they make a request to uh, the, the web server. Uh, Drupal picks that up, um, it interprets the request, it pulls in all the data that it needs to to, uh, to handle that request, and then it themes the output and returns to the user the full user interface uh, to the browser. So the user is receiving from Drupal the full, fully themed uh, HTML uh, interface. And there might be some elements of interactivity in there. You might include some JavaScript in what comes back that, that manipulate the page. But essentially, it's Drupal doing most of the layout, most of the theming for you, um, and not the... Um, uh, um, and, and, and so you're using Drupal in order to do that theme layer. Um, so uh, the way we were thinking about it was that uh, Drupal's providing, I mean, Drupal is many things, but it's providing two things to our end users, which is it is a content management system. So it's, it's for the administrators. It's the, the system by which they enter the content into the system. Um, and then it, it stores and manages that content. But it's also doing a secondary job, which is that it's the website delivery tool as well. So for our, our clients' end users, um, it's providing them the actual... Uh, the actual interface and the, the view of their, their website and the data and the content that they've entered into it. Um, and I suggest that uh, Drupal does one of those jobs really well, which is the content management system, the website delivery tool, um, it, particularly with Drupal 7 and where, where we're at the moment. Um, we, like I said before, we were in a, uh, finding a need for something that was allowing us to do um, more than, than what comes out of the box. Um, so just to uh, highlight the point a bit, Further, um, so when you're creating a content type within Drupal, uh, and you're adding your fields to it, what you're doing is 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 three things essentially. So, in creating your content type and your fields, um, you're creating your, your your data container, your data model um, in the database, uh, and, and that's great. So you, you create your, your content type and you add your fields to it, and you get all your database tables, and that's where all your data is going to get stored. Um, but at the same time as doing that, then you're also creating the the the, the, the administrator form, the form that the user is going to boom. That's where you're selecting your widgets on your fields. Uh, and you've got, now got the interface by which the administrator can enter content into the system. 
Um, and then, of course, you're doing the third thing as well, which is providing um, a, a rendered display of the content that's actually going to go out there. Um, and the first two jobs, you, you, you know, clicking around the interface, you've very quickly got your data model and your, um, and your, 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 your user form for your administrators. Um, and then you have to spend quite a bit of time getting your, um, your display right um, in the theming layer. Um, so AngularJS then takes over as, a, a, as an option to then take over that theming layer for you if you're going to use that within your uh, Drupal website. Uh, and there's several different models for this, and, and Dries touched on them during his, uh, his, his keynote. Um, what I'm going to talk about later when I do a sort of demonstration how you get started with AngularJS, I'm going to be looking at the fully decoupled model. Um, it has a lot of advantages and a lot of disadvantages, as, as has been covered elsewhere. Um, but in this, in the fully decoupled model, I mean, decoupled is a bit of a, in English, decoupled means it's, it's, there's no, no connection between them. What it really is is loosely coupled. So you, you're loosely coupling your front end from your back end, whereas before the front end was, was quietly integrated into the, um, uh, into the Drupal site and you know, it was possible to do SQL queries within the theming layer and this, this kind of thing by separating out and having your AngularJS application as a completely separate application. Um, then you're, you're loosely coupling from the front end to the back end. And now you've got something in between, which is your API. So your back end needs to provide the data in, uh, to the front end in a known format. And it will do this through these things called um, APIs. And you'll need to design an API that makes sense for your front end to be able to connect to it. And we'll look at it in more detail later when um, I go through the example. Um, the other model, the other way of using it, is that you let Drupal do some of the theming. Um, and this is what we've done with, um, with, uh, with a number of our clients, um, where Drupal is providing the, the header and the footer of the page and the menu, and, and it's doing things like the menu routing. Um, and then embedded within the page is our Angular application, which is then the rich interface. So, for example, in a search page, we might have the header and the footer and the menu. Uh, and then um, in the center of the page is our actual search tool. Um, and this one is kind of a progressive model, and this allows a sort of a, a, a hybrid of both the AngularJS and the Drupal application. Uh, and it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, a, a number of talks on this subject before have always talked about Drupal, um, the AngularJS application talking directly to, uh, to Drupal, uh, and then you have to think about how you're going to scale your, 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 your Drupal instance if, if perhaps you're going to be opening up that API to other, uh, other tools than just your website. Um, so, as an alternative um, model, and this is what we're using, um, that your administrators might be populating content within Drupal, um, but then Drupal is using something like the, um, the Search API module to then index that content out to some other service which provides a better API and, and faster integration to, um, to external services such as, uh, such as your AngularJS application. Um, so, in this instance here, we're, we're putting our data out of Drupal and then we're indexing it into a search appliance, so perhaps it's Solar or um, Elasticsearch. Uh, and Elasticsearch is particularly good because it's already got um, a, an API you can, then, um, you can then interact with with your, your AngularJS application. Um, so if you're a, a business owner or a, you're a technologist and you're, you're looking at evaluating um, uh, these tools and you're thinking about making a, a, a choice to actually start using a front-end framework, um, why would you pick AngularJS? Um, so uh, there's, there are a number of frameworks out there, and they're all they're all quite similar, and, and they, they have different um, pros and cons between them. But um, uh, the reason we went with AngularJS a year ago was that it's supported by Google, and Google put a lot of investment into it. Um, so it's not it's not going anywhere. Um, it's got a very large developer community as well. Um, so in the last year that we've used it, um, any problems we've come up with or any anything that we we're unsure how to implement, um, it's quite easy. You put the put your question into Google, and someone will have had that problem somewhere before. It will have been blogged about. There will be questions on Stack Exchange that have been answered. Um, so you get a lot of support with AngularJS, and there's a lot of people using it. And also, there's a large number of add-on modules as well. So for a lot of the problems that you'll have, you'll find that somebody else has already solved them in the form of a module. Um, there's ngmodules.org lists them, um, um, and you'll be able to find them um, on the internet for most of the things that you'll be doing. Um, one of the reasons for using any front-end framework is that you're going to be producing yourself a, a more robust and um, a cleaner code base, and this was one of the reasons we were we were looking to select it. Is that the JavaScript was starting to get quite untidy. Um, it was mixed in with the um, 
it's mixed in amongst uh, the, the, the PHP and the rest of the code base within Drupal. By separating out, we've now got um, uh, a much cleaner code base. Um, and using something like AngularJS, um, you've got a, a, a known recipe for sort of laying out your files, uh, laying out um, the way that everything's going to be working. And it's got all of these good, rich, you can see the rich vocabulary of things that come with it. If any of you have used, um, looked at Symfony already, then you'll recognize terms like dependency injection, like services. Um, these are all things you'd expect out of a modern um, software framework, not just a web framework, but a software framework. These are, these are the kind of tools you'll now be expecting. And this is the reason for using a front-end framework is that you get dependency injection. You can create services, you can create reusable code, um, and you can use um, plug-in modules as well. Okay, so before you begin, um, before you begin on uh, developing your AngularJS application, um, there's an awful lot of front-end technologies that you'll need to get familiar with as well. Um, so there's an awful lot of things that exist around to support you as a developer. A lot of tools, a lot of tooling, a lot of tool chain stuff that exists that you need to, um, you need to at least know what it is, and we'll go through each of these things. Um, so one of the first things you'll end up installing is um, Node and NPM. Uh, Node is a, um, a, a thing for executing JavaScript on the server. Um, and it's often used as a, a, as a web server itself. Um, for local development, you, the, the scripts that we'll show you later and the examples I'll show you later, um, you can run Node on your local environment and it will run your, uh, it will serve your, your application for you automatically. Um, NPM is a package manager for Node, so if you need to bring in any dependencies for Node, um, NPM is the tool that you'll be using. Um, so. If you're getting started with this, then the first things you'll be doing is installing Node and NPM. Um, there's some links up there, but you can usually install them from your um, operating system uh, package managers. And then you just check that Node's running with the node minus V command. Um, you'll also need a JavaScript package manager. Um, a Bower's uh, a popular choice. Um, and uh, what the JavaScript package manager does, and this is a bit like Composer for, for PHP, but um, uh, in the for, for your JavaScript front-end application. Uh, so you can pull in dependencies. So if you, you uh, require um, other libraries, then you can use Bower to pull those in. We'll see how that works later. Um, Bower gets installed globally. You can install Bower globally onto your system using npm install minus g Bower. So once you've got npm installed, you can just pull that in. Um, the next thing you'll be wanting to look at is using something like a uh, is using a task runner. Um, there's several choices uh, for these. Um, I suggest start with with Grunt, but um, Gulp is getting a, a lot of interest, and there's, there's Broccoli as well, which is a, a newer one. But um, as you start to get into front end frameworks, like these sort of things start to make more sense as you as you as you use them more and understand what they are. So a task runner um, basically allows you to create um, a script, um, contain scripts which do particular tasks. Um, so an example of a task might be a test task. Um, and then you can create a thing that actually like, tells, uh, tells the system how to run the tests on your application. Um, and the reason you do this and then you save that with your, um, with your, with your code base is that the next, time, uh, the next developer that checks out your code, um, when, they, when they look at it, they can see there's a test task already. They can just run the test task and it, it will just automatically run the test. So they don't need to know how your particular um, uh, project is configured, they can just run the tests and understand how that works. Another kind of tasks you might do is, is kind of a build or deployment tasks. So it just automates a lot of the, the grunt work that you would have to do to um, when you're building your applications. Um, the next tool is a scaffolding tool. Um, Yeoman is a popular choice. Um, there are others, um, but Yeoman is one we'll be looking at. Um, a scaffolding tool um, takes away a lot of the, the work for uh, building your application to start with, so it, as, it, as it describes a scaffolding tool. Um, so install it with that command, and what you'll do is the people will have created recipes out there for particular types of project. So if you, um, and, and, and we'll, we'll have a look at one later um, that, uh, that's particularly good for, for, for Angular projects. Um, but it will build up your, uh, it builds up your application from the start. So starting with nothing, you, you start with a yeoman script and, and and say, yeah, I'd like to use um, Bootstrap, and I want to use um, these these libraries and dependencies, and it will start building that out for you. Um, the other things you'll need to get uh, familiar with are testing frameworks. 
Um, so Karma is the uh, one that comes with, um, uh, with Angular, and Angular put, puts a, a lot of effort into um, uh, making this work. Um, this is a, a, a full end-to-end -end test framework. Um, other frameworks are obviously available. Um, we use BHAT for most of our work just because we already know what BHAT is, but um, uh, Karma is the one that's particularly used for, um, uh, uh, for AngularJS applications. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through now some of the steps that you, you go through to, to actually start off building um, your Angular application with Drupal 8. Um, so with, with Drupal 8, so this, as, a, as an example, what we're going to use is the Views module and the RESTful Web Services module. Um, and the Views module, um, we all know what that does. It provides a listing of, um, of content on your system. And the RESTful Web Services module um, provides a way of serializing that so that you'll get what you get out of uh, that listing view from views is, is, is a pure JSON output. So this is the actual development of an API. Um, and this is quite a simple um, example of how this might work. Um, but I'll uh, now go through um, the steps involved in that. Um, so once you've got your Drupal website set up um, inside of your structure. Um, so just to give you an idea of what, what we're doing here. So. Um, what I'm going to build is a, is a blogging platform. Um, so we're going to have uh, the administrator logs into Drupal and writes their blogs. Um, the end users, oh dear, yeah. Uh, the end users um, come in to uh, uh, the end users are going to use an Angular application to actually view the uh, view the blogs. Um, okay, so if we have a look inside our content types, you can see I've created a blog content type already. And if we have a look at the fields. Um, it's just got a single field, which is the body field, and then obviously it's got the, the title to go with it as well. And then under structure, and then views, uh, I've created a, a viewer slash blog. If we have a quick look at this. Just zoom in there. Okay, so... Um, So the type of view that this is, uh, it, the, the display ID is, is a REST export. So this is provided by the um, this is provided by um, the RESTful Web Services module. So there's a new display type called the REST export. Um, so this is what this is. Um, it, the format is serializer there, and we've got a choice as to how we show the data. Um, so this can be. Um, you know, the full rendered entity, or you can be very specific and decide which fields you're going to want to show. So I've chosen to show the fields because I want to have quite a bit of control over what the data goes out of the system. Um, so here we can see what kind of fields I've selected. So there's a title field, UUID to uniquely identify the content, um, a body field, which is going to be the, the raw HTML that people have entered in, the admins entered into the system. Um, I've also provided the, the the path alias and also the machine name, which is going to be blog post. Um, and we'll see why I've done that later. Um, I've also provided a contextual filter. Um, so if we put slash blog slash and then a UUID, we're going to get just a specific blog back again. Um, so to see what that now looks like, I'll go to those paths. So if I go to slash blog now, I'm going to get raw JSON returned, which is all of, the, all of the blog posts on the system, but just the data. And if I take a specific UUID, and apply it at the end, then I just get the one blog post return now, which matches that UUID. Okay, so after all that, we're now ready to start the front end development now. Um, so the first thing you might do is to, is to scaffold your app. So um, the last uh, tool we looked at there was the scaffolding tool. Um, so we're going to be using Yeoman for this. Um, and there are pre-made pre recipes out there for starting your Angular app development. So if you've never done this before, this is a great place to start now. So if you've followed through all the slides I've done so far and you've installed all the base dependencies, at this point we run these three commands, which is we're going to make a, make a directory um, called Angular Drupal 8. So that's going to be the name of our project. Uh, then we switch into the uh, into that directory, and then we just type yo Angular, and then name the project Angular Drupal 8, and press enter. And Yo will ask a couple of questions on whether we want to use um, uh, SAS or um, uh, for the CSS. 
uh, and it also asks whether we want to use Bootstrap and, um, and these kind of things. Um, but it, it, they're, very, they're very short number of questions. And what you get left with um, after that is, um, uh, is it goes away and builds it all in. It pulls all the dependencies in, and you get this um, project structure. See me there. Um, so I'll just go through the, uh, the, the anatomy now of, a, of, a, of an Angular application. So this is, a, remember, this is completely divorced now of, of our Drupal site, so this is a completely separate project. This is the full decoupled version. Um, so within here, we've got the app directory, and this is where we're going to put all our source code. So this is where all our custom code is going uh, to be ending up. There's two other directories here, which is Bower components and node modules. These are both library directories, so this is going to be this is where all those uh, dependencies get pulled in for uh, Node and for Bower. Um, so Node is for our, our server side, um, uh, the, the, the Node that's running on the server, and Bower are um, dependencies that Angular needs. So this is going to be um, dependencies on the web application itself. Um, the dist folder um, gets created uh, as well. So this is our source code lives in slash apt. Uh, slash app, but when we want to actually release our code to um, to production, then we'll compile it. So, and, and compiling in the in a front end terms means that we're going to take all the JavaScript files, concatenate them all together, uh, minify them. Um, SAS, we're going to turn into CSS and minify that. Um, and there's a, a whole bunch of other things you can do in terms of like making the um, uh, HTML smaller and, and and rebuilding things. So, what, all of those tasks are, are looked after uh, are looked after for us automatically by. Um, by the grunt runner. And we'll have a look at that in a moment. So the other, um, the other uh, folder of, of note is the test folder. So your test should live with the rest of your code base. Um, so any test you write should exist inside here as well. So if we're writing Karma tests, um, they'll exist inside the test folder. So the other file to, uh, of interest is the grunt.js file. This got created for us automatically by the Yeoman recipe. Um, I haven't had to modify this at all. It's just there. Um, and inside this, it defines several tasks, several things that can, um, that can be done on the system, um, that can be done within the project. Now, if you're using um, a, uh, an IDE like um, um, a WebStorm or a PHP Storm, um, they, it's grunt aware and it can see that there's a grunt file within it. So I get within my IDE um, a little panel which tells me what tasks grunt is going to be providing as part of this project. So if the, this is the first time I've downloaded this project, uh, I'm just about to start work on it as a developer. Um, someone's already gone, gone to the trouble of setting me up a build task, which is the thing that if I double click this, it will create that dist folder, it will minify all my um, uh, JavaScript and CSS, um, and produce me my production, um, my production product. So I don't need to know what the steps are in order to do that, it's someone's already put the effort in to do it. And in fact, I haven't even had to do that this time as well, because this was provided for me by the Yeoman recipe that I, I used to actually scaffold the app in the first place. Um, some of the other tasks in here are the test tasks. So like I was talking about before, if I double click this, it will run all the tests on the system and tell me whether, um, whether, whether it's compliant with all the tests. Uh, and the last one, which is of interest, is the, the serve one. And if I run this one now, what this does is it does all the um, work that's required um, to, uh, to run the node server and it automatically fires up the web browser. So, so far I've run three commands after I've installed, um, if, you, if you've got your system set up correctly, so far I've just run the three commands and two of those was just creating the directory and moving into it. Um, the third one was running the Yeoman application to, to build the application from, from the Yeoman recipe. Uh, and then I've just come into my um, IDE, double clicked, serve, and we're ready to go. We've got a, an application uh, built, and, uh, built and ready. Um, and if we look down here as well, you can see it says it's waiting. So um, it's also got live reload built into it. So it's sat there waiting to see it's, it's, it's as if I'm going to make any edits to my code base, and then it'll automatically reload it. So if I just move this around just to show you what that looks like. Um, so I'm going to go into my app directory, which is where my source code's contained. Uh, and I'm just going to make a modification to the home page. And then I just save that file. And then automatically the page is library loaded. So um, it, these kind of things are really powerful if you work if you haven't worked with with these things before. I mean, there are modules for this within Drupal as well. But um, this is really good if you're a front end developer and you want to get these kind of productivity wins. Um, this kind of stuff just comes out of the box um, with 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 this recipe that was provided for us by uh, uh, for Yeoman. Um, okay, cool. So um, let's start. 
diving into the app directory now so we can see what, what, what is made up of a, an Angular application. Um, so uh, when it's an application on its own and not one that's embedded within another one, then they, they often call it um, a single page application. And the single page is that index.html file, so this is the single page of the, of the single page application. And if I open this up, then you should see that it, it's full of um, HTML. So HTML is the templating language for AngularJS. So anyone that, um, uh, anyone that knows HTML should be able to get started pretty quickly with um, uh, the templating side of things. Um, so if we have a look down here, you can see most of the HTML. There are a few um, comments that have been added in here as, um, as well. Um, these are comments which are giving information to the build, the build scripts, the grunt scripts, um, to tell it where to, uh, where to do things. So for example, right at the bottom of the file here, we have the script tags which are pulling in our dependencies. So we've got dependencies on Bower components there. So um, things like jQuery, um, AngularJS itself are all being pulled in. Um, and we've also got dependencies on uh, things within the scripts directory. So this is our own code, uh, starting with the app.js file, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, but each of these are wrapped in comments, which are telling Bower that this is where our dependencies have been injected. And if we have a quick look inside of the disk, the disk folder, so once we've built the application, you notice those things just aren't in there because the process that um, the grunt task goes through when it makes the final production version is all these things get minified down. So we just have a, a script spot file and a vendor file. So that's our custom code and our, um, our library code. All is um, a small minified files, which is, um, which is obviously really good for the production system um, and also really good that you didn't have to build those yourselves. It's all it all comes out of the grunt task runner. Um, so next thing though is we're, we're, we're building a, a blogging platform now, so we want to show people um, the blogs that have been created. So we, we need, a, an M, we need a, a, a menu link for slash blog. So this is, uh, this is hard coded. So here we have the menu, uh, the server inside the index.html file here. Uh, here's the menu, we've got three menu links, one of which is slash blog. So if we look at the page, there's our slash blog endpoint. Um, so, so when we click on slash blog, um, how does Angular know what to do, what to render on the page? Um, so one other thing to look at here is that uh, you place your Angular module um, and you tell it what its scope is within the context of the HTML document itself. So here on the body tab, we've got the ng-app directive, um, which is linking to our module. So this is, and we'll see where that name comes from in a second. But this is saying that our, our module has got um, uh, the scope of the body of the page. And a little bit further down the HTML as well, we've got a second Angular directive here, which is ng-view. Um, so this is where the content of the page is going to reside. And ng-view is a directive which is used by an Angular module called ng-root. Um, and based on the root, the page, so if we're on the home page or whether we're on the blog page or whichever page of the site we are, ng-root makes the decision as to which page we are and then what code we'll need to run within the Angular application in order to produce the content of the page. Okay, so so far we've defined, we've, we've put our link onto slash blog. Now we have to tell Angular what slash blog means. Um, inside the app.js file, so we're inside the scripts directory. Inside app.js, um, we define our module. So there's the name of our module, which you saw inside the index HTML file as being attached to the body. So that's the scope for this module. Um, the next thing that we, we define for the module is the list of Angular module dependencies. So one of the dependencies here is ng-root, um, which is the thing that decides what to do depending on the, the URL. Uh, and then underneath this, we're now going to configure our module. So this is sort of the, the, the bootstrapping phase of um, actually telling the module what's going on. Uh, it's worth stopping for a moment just to have a look at this, this line here. Um, this is AngularJS's dependency injection. So there are two services, well, there are several services, but there's two that this function we want to make use of. Um, there's one called the root provider and one called the location provider. And simply by putting these known service names as variables into that function call, Angular, when it runs, it will inject the correct service into this function. So root provider is the name of the root provider service by just putting dollar root provider in there. Now dollar root provider is a thing that we can use um, within this function. Um, so one of the things I've done in this application here is that uh, I've made a, a depend on the location provider. And what I've wanted to do here um, is use clean URLs. Um, so ordinarily with Angular, um, the out of the box, you'll see URLs that look a bit like this um, with a hashtag inside them. And if you want a clean URL that doesn't have the hash, so we want to have slash about directly, um, then you need to enable HTML, uh, HTML5 mode. Uh, and there's a couple of things you need to do. You need this line in your configuration for your module. Um, and also within the index HTML, 
um, you need to specify the base path like this. So as long as those two things are in there, then you can use clean, um, uh, clean URLs. Um, the second thing that we're now doing within the configuration is, is telling the ng-root uh, module what to do at each URL. So slash is the home page. Um, slash blog is going to be our blog, uh, our blog listing page. And within here, we've got um, two main things to look at, which are the template that's going to be used. So that's, that's what's going to be used for the content. So where we saw inside of the index.html, there was an ng-view component. Um, we're going to use this template specified here to to lay out the content within that ng view. Um, and we're going to use the blog controller as the thing that's going to be doing the logic and, and, and creating the actual variables and the, the data that we need uh, uh, for that view. So if we start looking at the blog controller first, um, so this is the blog controller. There's not much to it. Um, just zoom in there. So this is the blog controller. There's, yeah, like I say, there's not a lot to it. Um, we define it for our, for our module, so that's the name of our module. We say there is a controller, and it's called the blog controller. Um, we've got a dependency on two services, one of which is dollar scope, which is the global scope. Um, what the global scope is, is it's a place where you can place data, and it makes that data available both within the controller and also within the view. Um, so when the view is going to be interested in um, the, the value of blogs here. So we've added blogs to it, which starts off as the empty array. And the second service that I'm depending on is the $HTTP service. Um, this is Angular's uh, tool for making AJAX requests. So um, by depending on the HTTP service, uh, we can now specify our path. So that's the path to our API that we saw earlier. So this is Drupal 8 providing me with a list of blogs in JSON format. And we just get that list of blogs, and we set it to uh, the value of, dollar, uh, of blogs on, dollar sc on, the, on the scope, on the global scope. OK. so. So, so all the control has done is got the value, got the blogs from, from Drupal, and it's just shoved them onto uh, a variable called blogs on the global scope. Now, the second thing we saw in the, uh, in the router was that uh, we were going to use a particular um, template. So if I now look inside of the listings and blog, so this was the template that was going to be used. Again, there's not a lot to it. Um, so ng repeat there, you see on that, that, that first div, um, this is an Angular directive, and it's basically a for each loop. And what we're saying is, for, for every blogs in blog, and where does blogs come from? It's on the global scope. It's available to both the, um, uh, uh, it's available within the view. It got set by the controller. So for every blog that exists in, in blogs, uh, we're going to loop over, and we're going to put a H2 on the page, and we're going to put an A-link on the page. And the H2 is going to be the title of the blog, and the, the A-link is going to uh, link to um, uh, blog slash, and then the UUID. Um, and so just to show you that quickly, okay, so this is it doing it. It's done a request to Drupal. We've got a list of blogs back. Each of those is the, um, the, the, the title of the blog and then um, a link to its UUID version. So that, when we click there, we've now got a URL that says blog slash UUID. Uh, how does Angular know what to do with that? Well, it's, it's exactly the same again. Uh, within our um, app.js, we've specified blog slash and then that colon UUID means that there's gonna be a variable um, which, uh, which is going to be the UID. Uh, we've specified we're going to be using the blog post controller this time, and we're going to be using a different template, which is the blog post HTML. So really quickly, let's just look at that. Here I've defined another, um, another controller against my module. This is the blog post controller, so uh, it does exactly, almost exactly the same thing as before, except this time it's, it's asking for data from um, uh, including the UID. We've got a, a, a dependency on the root parameters um, service that Angular provides. And we've grabbed the UID off that service um, in order to construct the path that we talked to Drupal from. Um, cool. So, I mean, that's a kind of a, a very quick overview of all of the components of, of the, the basic components of, of Angular and to show you how you might start building up an application. I mean, there's an awful lot more to it. Um, and a lot has been said about the dangers of building an application like this because you, you sort of walk away from all of the things that Drupal provides you with. So, um, you know, we're anonymous here. I haven't shown you how to do a login, uh, login form. Those kind of things are going to get very uh, much more complex with this kind of um, this kind of route, um, way of doing things. Um, also, you know, I hard coded the menu there. You probably want to use Drupal to to manage your menu because your admins are going to want to move things around in the menu and add things like that. Uh, and also, we've got a URL which looks like this, which isn't um, the you know, it's not the prettiest URLs. You think, well, actually, I want to be able to specify my own URL for uh, for any piece of content. Uh, I don't want to um, have to have a known route for every type of content within the system. Um, so um, just as an example, I've, I've shown out uh, there's a way of perhaps solving the, um, the URL alias problem there. So when I go to slash about, 
um, I get the about page back from Drupal. Um, but what I haven't done is define that within my uh, uh, within my uh, root provider here. So there isn't a slash about. I, I haven't specifically um, requested that. So what we've said here is that there's this kind of this otherwise thing that comes about. So if none of the routes match, then we'll use a controller that's going to manage our routing for us. Um, so I built a controller called the content controller. Um, and I've created a template at uh, view slash content. So let's have a look at the content controller quickly. Um, so the content controller is quite simple again. Um, it's going to talk to a, a, Drupal, uh, a Drupal API endpoint called slash content, and it takes uh, as an argument the path that we're currently on. I get the path from uh, the location uh, service there, which gives it me on location.path, and then I'll ask Drupal, okay, I'm on this path, what is the content that should be on this path? Um, and then if we have a look at what that might look like. Um, so, slash about, it, yeah. so we go to Drupal and ask it what, what what, what's it slash about? And Drupal responds and says, well, it's a, it's a, it's a node of type page, and uh, here's its title, here's its body, here's its UUID, so it's, it's sending us the exact data back. So we've let Drupal do the path aliasing. Um, and so if we then look at the uh, templating, um, so this is the, the content HTML template. So um, here I'm using a directive called ng-switch, and this does, as you'd expect, this is a switch statement, and it's looking at the value of page.type. Page is the page that got returned um, from Drupal, and dot .type is obviously its the value of type, um, and there's three things that can happen, so there's three cases for this switch statement. Uh, when that value is undefined, which it will be when the application first runs, because it, Drupal hasn't responded yet, then um, there's, there's nothing there, so I've said don't do anything. Um, if you were a designer, you'd probably have some form of animated loading GIF in there. Uh, if uh, Drupal responded with a not found, um, within my controller, I just set the value of page what type to not found, and I'll just show the 404 page instead. Um, and if, um, uh, if it responded with a type, so we've got the page type, then we'll, we'll dynamically load the correct template within the Angular application uh, for that page type. Um, so that's, that's quite a simplest, uh, simplistic example of the kind of things you can do, but it just shows that, that you know, some of these problems are solvable, um, and it depends on the complexity of your application, the type of, um, uh, type of the client that you're dealing with, and, and what, your, what your needs are. Okay, so I mentioned the clean URLs there, so that's the HTML5 mode. Uh, okay, yeah, so installing other modules. So um, at some point, you're, at this point, we're, we're now thinking, oh, it's, my, my app's going quite well so far. You know, it hasn't taken me a great deal of time to um, uh, get to this point. Um, I now want to add some, some other functionality which somebody else in the world must have solved at some point before. Um, so perhaps you want to add an infinite scroll to that blog listing page. Um, so we, we, we want to be able to just keep scrolling, keep seeing blogs. Um, so you type into Google, um, AngularJS, Infinite Scroll, and this page comes up first. Uh, and you have a look around at the documentation and think, yeah, this is the kind of thing that, uh, this, this looks like the right thing that I want to use. Um, and so uh, what we do then is um, we'll install it using, uh, using Bower, which remember is the package manager for um, our JavaScript application. Um, the, the website gives you the instructions on what to do. You type in Bower install, ng Infinite Scroll, uh, and then you'll, get, uh, uh, then you'll get the dependency automatically downloaded. Um, in order to use a dependency, um, if there's a couple of things you've then got to do. Um, so we need to make sure that the JavaScript for that dependency is included on our, in our page. So down here within the script tags, we've got to make sure that our new dependency is added. So if we've just added that one as a dependency, um, we have to make sure that the JavaScript is included. Um, and the second thing we've got to do is to tell Angular itself that we're going to depend on a module. So within our app.js file, uh, right at the top, when we first define the module, we list our dependencies, um, and we would add our new dependency, our new um, infinite scrolling dependency inside of there. Um, okay, so I, I said in the thing, I, I mentioned Drupal 7 as well, because we're, um, we're, we're using uh, this with Drupal 7. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do the uh, 
I mean, in terms of the Angular application, you know, it, it doesn't really matter what your back end is, you just open the API up. So within Drupal 7, there's certain um, uh, uh, modules that exist which allow you to build those um, uh, those endpoints. Um, the services module is is, um, is quite well used by a lot of people. Um, it's got quite a lot of GUI configuration within it to get it set up. Um, and then what you get is kind of, it just opens up all, all nodes on your system uh, are made available. Um, we like to be able to control that a little bit more. Um, there are hooks for the services module, so you can override um, the way that it's going to send that data back and, and, and do your own one. Um, but I, I'd re recommend looking at the next module down if you're um, more code orientated and you want to build these things out a bit more is the RESTful, um, RESTful module. Because um, that's uh, that allows you to create objects which define your REST services and it allows you to be very specific about the uh, um, the data that gets returned at your, um, uh, your particular URLs. Um, and there's also a, a Yeoman script that's been created by the, the guys at uh, uh, Gizra, um, and they've, they've talked about this before, um, uh, which is uh, really quite interesting. Um, this, this Yeoman script, uh, if you use it, it builds you out uh, everything. So not just the Angular application, but also um, it builds you out a Drupal 7 instance as well and starts adding um, all the defenses um, inside there that it thinks you're going to need for building a, a, a Drupal plus Angular uh, headless uh, decoupled web application. Um, and it also includes BHAT as the, as the testing framework. So um, if you wanted to try this out with Drupal 7, and um, uh, then this is a great place to start because someone's done an awful lot of the legwork for you um, in order uh, for, for defining all of the things that you think you're going to need in order to run these applications. Uh, and that's, that, that's kind of the end there. So thanks very much for listening. Um, I hope you've any questions. Yeah. I think there's a mic in the center if you want to use it. Hi. Um, I'd like to, if you don't mind, if you could go into a little more detail about how to handle uh, like forms and the form API and you know user service, the quiz module. Yeah, you mentioned yourself user login. Could you outline just the steps uh, or the challenges in handling that sort of thing? Uh, yeah, well, um, yeah, that, I mean, that is a subject in itself, and I think we could probably stand here for quite some time talking about those things. Um, yeah, I mean, a format, uh, one of the reasons for picking Angular, and it's one of the reasons that we chose it as well, is, is because um, uh, you, the, the limitations of using um, uh, uh, form API and being able to build dynamic forms. Um, so AngularJS has within it everything you'll need to build um, uh, uh, good dynamic forms. Um, the two-way data binding that we I've really got into in this talk, but um, allows you to connect something on the scope, uh, a variable within the scope, to a form element on the page, so that when the user interacts with the page, it's manipulating the scope, and then your JavaScript can can respond to what's happening uh, to the changes that the user is making on the page. Um, and this kind of thing is very powerful in terms of building up a data model, which you'll then um, search particularly, and this is the, the, the reason we use it, um, if the user's made sort of 15 different choices in a search interface before they've actually done the search, we can build up that data model and then and then submit that as a, as a, as a post request to the Drupal application, um, and then we'll handle that request and return the data, the specific data that um, needs to be returned. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, that, that's how we're using it. Um, I think there's an awful lot of nuances there that we could, we could spend a lot of time talking about in terms of how you would... Um, uh, how you build forms uh, with AngularJS. I think that's, a, like I say, a subject for itself. But thanks very much for your question. <laughs> Is there any others? Uh, yes, so um, the question was, um, is, a, is the presentation available? Um, I'll, um, I'll get the presentation online. Um, if you follow me on, uh, on the, the Twitter handle there, I'll, uh, I'll tweet it um, at some point today so you can, you can get hold of it. Um, I mean, a lot of the presentation was um, uh, me clicking around in the user interface. Uh, so um, I, I think they, they put all these up online, so you'll be able to watch it, uh, watch back through uh, later. Uh, any other questions? Um, knowing that Angular 2 is around the corner, are you recommending people in the room to uh, adopt Angular today or to wait for Angular 2? Um, so I wouldn't recommend anything to anyone, but uh, <laughs> uh, I mean we're using we're using Angular One. Um, I mean, there's such a huge resource, um, wealth of resources out there. There's an awful lot of people using it. I, I don't see any uh, pressing need to um, uh, to wait for Angular 2. 
Um, I don't know uh, personally quite when Angular 2 is coming, but I do know there's a quite a significant change to the code base. I think it's as, at least as much as Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Um, so yes, uh, if you learn Dru um, Angular 1.3, 1.4 now, um, you're going to have to relearn things later. But there's so many other things. I mean, if you've not used a front-end framework before, I mean, the, the, all of the other stuff that I talked about, Node and Grunt and Gulp and the task runners, automatic deployments, all these things are going to be, they're, they're going to be of, of use every, every time. And it's just the, the nuances of the syntax for Angular itself that's going to change from, from one, one release to the next. Um, so, yeah, I think it's definitely something you should, you should start thinking about getting into now, and it's definitely worth looking at the, uh, the Angular applications. Hi, can you speak just a little bit to um, some of the agency considerations like scoping, um, making sure that your staff is ready to go, and that type of thing? Yeah, exactly. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. So um, in terms of uh, how you would need to structure your team around this, um, I think uh, some people have written about the dangers of, of going down this approach, and particularly the completely decoupled system where there's, there's this thought that perhaps you'll have two um, suddenly you, you'd split your team in half and rather than everyone being Drupal developers, suddenly you've got a bunch of front-end developers, a bunch of back-end developers, and then they only talk to each other you know, once every three weeks at a, at a big team meeting. Um, I, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend that as the way of structuring your projects. Um, so the way that we work is that our project teams are composed of someone who is primarily front-end, someone who's primarily back-end, but there's a lot of um, interact, um, uh, overlap between them. And they're just two, two people that would have always been in the project anyway, just they were both through, within Drupal. Um, and the feedback we've had from our front-end developers is always that and this is very freeing for them, um, that they can kind of they don't need to know the, 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 the specifics of Drupal. And there's an awful lot of people out there that don't know Drupal but are very proficient in the front-end frameworks. Um, and so as an agency, if you're looking at um, you know, particularly hiring and, and understanding how to build your team up, you can find, you'll probably be able to find yourself some very good front-end developers that perhaps don't know Drupal, and, but that will be very useful inside of a team that's composed of Drupal developers and front-end developers. And, and this approach allows you to start separating that out. Um, yeah, John, can you give uh, some concrete examples of the sort of exciting things that we can do with it, um, ideally even showing us, but, uh, at least telling us, because uh, <laughs> I mean, I see what you do, but I, yeah. I think, okay, well, I can do that with Drupal at the moment, you yeah, know, yeah. the, the sim very simple examples. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's as things get more complex. Um, I mean, there's, you know, the, I'm, I haven't got any specific examples to um, to demonstrate today, but um, I mean, there's 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 plenty of examples of stuff out there. But it, it it's where you start to turn your application when when your web application becomes more of an application, less of just a form that someone's filling in. So there's an awful lot more elements that are going on. So I gave the example before of. Um, um, a user may have done a lot of things within the interface before you make your callback, before you do your search. So they may be making um, selections on, um, you know, multiple facets all at the same time. That, that and, and making a choice of one facet may reduce the number of facets to somewhere else. Um, so you start to build up a data model within um, within your just your front end, and then you just send that directly back to the server and say, well, what what results does this does this provide? Um, so I. I don't think I answered your question exactly, but um, it, it's, it's, as you, it's as the complexity increases that um, both the code base becomes more unmanageable if you're not using something that is more structured, um, and also the ability to, um, to do more interesting things becomes restricted if you're not using uh, a front-end framework, or at least that's what we found. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, I guess we'll leave it there then. So thanks very much. Cheers.